Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we consider the events that have been happening in our country and state, in our nation and in our world over the past few months, it does us more good than you can possibly imagine that we prayed, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love just now. Because our poor, broken, sick world needs love. God's life-transforming love expressed through our words and actions now more than ever. And even though as a congregation we are parted from each other by the necessary need for physical distance, as this coronavirus roars through our state and county at this time, we hold one another closely through our prayers, our phone calls and video calls over the internet, and by emails and notes dropped in the mail. Three times in the gospel lesson today, Jesus reminds his followers to have no fear. Do not fear and do not be afraid. And though the circumstances that Jesus speaks of differ from what we are going through in our lives at this time, the principle is the same. We do not fear what the world fears or can do to us or what might happen to us, for our lives are, as Paul says in the opening of the third chapter of the, book, uh, the letter to the Colossians, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Kindle in us the fire of your love, we pray. Oh, how true and how necessary is that prayer today and every day, for we are living in some of the most challenging times that many of us have seen in our lifetime. Kindle in us the fire of your love, we pray. Send forth your spirit, the prayer continues, and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. That's what is needed at this time in our world. A love rekindled that shall renew the face of the earth. Some of you may know that Beth and Jonathan and I lived in South Carolina for 11 years. But most of you probably don't know that from 1996 until 2000, it was my privilege and joy to be the priest in charge of an African-American congregation in the Diocese of Upper South Carolina. By the time I had arrived, St. Barnabas Episcopal Church had been in Jenkinsville for 111 years. It was an Episcopal church that was started by slave owners for their slaves. Let that sink in for a minute. Now, the original building for that church was long gone. And the people of St. Barnabas worshipped worshipped in a modest brick building now, constructed sometime in the 1970s, I would guess, by the style. Now, on the property of that church, there was a huge tree and a grove of old trees. It's an old, huge old oak tree, well over 100 years old. And on one Sunday, one of the elder statesmen of that historic African-American congregation took me on a tour of the property and told me that it was on this tree, on the church property, mind you, that back in the day, bad slaves were hung by the neck until dead. Can you imagine having that physical reminder of slavery, oppression, and hate not 50 feet from the church where you went to worship every Sunday? During the time I served as priest in charge for St. Barnabas, a flurry of church burnings were taking place across the state of South Carolina. Churches where primarily black people worshipped were being burned down by white supremacists. 
in an effort to continue to intimidate and terrify members of the black community across that state. Now, I went out to St. Barnabas only on Sundays, every Sunday. My role was to lead the monthly bishops' committee meetings and to provide regular weekly services for this small worshiping community. And we had anywhere from 15 to 25 persons in church on Sunday, but many more, of course, around the major holidays. But I can remember times when my stomach would tie in knots from worry about whether my little church would be standing by the time I arrived. And fortunately, it was. Every Sunday, I went there. And even though I spent four years there as their priest and pastor, I barely scratched the surface in understanding what it truly must feel like to be treated so badly for so long by white Americans who saw them as less than fully human. Of course, this idea that black people were less than fully human is enshrined in our Constitution, the Three-Fifths Clause, Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution in 1787 declared that for purposes of representation in Congress, enslaved blacks in a state would be counted as three-fifths of the number of white inhabitants of that state. I'm reading from a website called blackpast.org. It goes on, when Constitutional Convention Delegate Roger Sherman of Connecticut proposed that congressional representation be based on the total number of inhabitants of a state, Delegate Charles Pinckney of South Carolina agreed, saying blacks ought to stand on an equality with whites, end quote. Pinckney's statement, however, was disingenuous, since at that time he knew most blacks were enslaved in his state, and none, slave or free, could vote or were considered equals of white South Carolinians, end quote. So from its very beginnings, black persons in our country did not fall under nor were included in the broad light shining from a hill vision cast by Thomas Jefferson that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All men are created equal didn't apply in this case because black persons could be owned as property and treated however the owner wanted to treat his property. And some white people in our country still feel that all men are created equal doesn't apply to people of color. Just a few weeks ago, if you recall, we renewed our baptismal covenant on the Feast of Pentecost. And one of the reasons I'm so in love with the Episcopal Church is the baptismal covenant, because for the first time in my life, I discovered the job, the job description of what it means to be a Christian. You see, I grew up in a church whose primary concern, whose evangelistic goal in converting people was to save their souls, was to help people escape the fires of hell. For them, the good news was that we didn't have to go to hell. And on the face of it, I can see why people would think that's good news notwithstanding that for most of us Christians, our visions of hell have been far more inspired by Dante's Inferno than anything in the Gospels or in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament. But in the Episcopal Church, I learned that the goal of becoming a Christian was to become a transformed person. Salvation was to save us from ourselves, our bad thinking and behavior, and be, deli and be delivered from the hatred that at times dwells in our hearts. Jesus came that we might be transformed, that our hearts might be transformed. In John's gospel, Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He was not talking about the afterlife. He was talking about the life of which, the life which we are in right now, the life that you are called to live right now. And the baptismal covenant in the Book of Common Prayer calls us to that life and tells us what it looks like. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? Will you persevere in resisting evil? And whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? And to each and every one of these questions we answer, I will with God's help. 
And we need God's help because it is only by God's help that we're going to get through this as a nation. And I have no doubt that we shall get through this, but it is going to be rough. Truth has to be told. We have to learn that systemic racism has been in the DNA of our country since its inception. And the time to begin a conversation to deal with this, to confess the sin of it, and to repent and make it right, has arrived. This is a good news moment for us as a nation. One of the books I read while on vacation was Michael Battle's Ubuntu. I didn't read all of it. I read the opening chapters. But Ubuntu, in I and You and You and Me, the title of the book. The book is mostly about a theology that sees our human completeness in the complementarity of the other. Ubuntu was introduced to the Episcopal world by Archbishop, Anglican Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And this book quotes Desmond Tutu a lot. Ubuntu is an African word. And Father Battle writes, for Tutu, Ubuntu is the environment of vulnerability, a set of relationships in which persons are able to recognize that their humanity is bound up in the other's humanity. Ubuntu means personhood forms ultimately through the church as the church witnesses to the world that God is the one who loves human identities into being long before individuals ever conceived of rights or developed perceptions of tyranny. In other words, God's love is prevenient. It is there before everything else and calls all justifications for control to account. As a Christian, no one can claim control of life. To gain the vision to negotiate how to be in the world is to access the life of, gra of grace and God. And any claim of control or power is delusory and foolish, end quote. And one last quote from Michael Battle's little book. The spirituality of Ubuntu is more about participation in the process of becoming lovable persons. Because God's love is what defines humanity. Persons are liberated from the desire to achieve, to impress, and most of all, to turn human persons into things or objects. Archbishop Tutu states, we are the children of divine love, and nothing can change that fund fundamental fact about us. The deduction that God has made us lovable persons in Christ encourages a Christian spirituality in which all of life, all of life becomes interdependent, end quote. It is this interdependence that is alluded to in the baptismal covenant, particularly in the last two vows. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? There's really no getting around it. The promises we made in baptism and renew regularly in our baptismal vows compel us to speak out for people who are suffering injustice, oppression, poverty, homelessness, hunger, and the list goes on. Christian life is a life of love for one's neighbor in whatever shape and form that neighbor is presented to us because ultimately it is Jesus Christ who is presented to us. This is what Jesus tells us in the story of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25 that Debbie wrote about a few weeks ago when she wrote for me while I was on vacation. We are called to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give water to the thirsty, and visit the sick and in prison. In the baptismal covenant, we promised to strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being, and that is what is lost in our world today. Respect for the dignity of every human being a desire for justice for all people, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. In other words, living the golden rule. And for the Christian, seeking and serving Christ in all persons, in the other, especially the other of a different race and color who doesn't look like me. In his lectionary studies blog post for this Sunday, Lutheran theologian Paul Nuchterlein writes the following. Quote, for people of the New Testament, racism is one of those powers and principalities that can, draw, can destroy our humanity, our souls. 
How does Derek Chauvin hold his knee on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes as his life breath slips away without a diminished humanity due to racism and his failure to stand against it? How does Garrett Rolfe shoot an unarmed Rayshard Brooks in the back twice, violently kicking his dying body without his human compassion having been quashed by the power of racism and is not being accountable to resisting it? Failing to speak out against racism and acting to dismantle it ends up as compliance to the continuing violence at levels at black bodies. It is also to give in to the way it robs white people of their full humanity, destroying our souls a little at a time. White supremacist racism has caused untold suffering for millions of people of color, 528 years for Native peoples, 401 years for African American people. It has also been destroying the souls of white people over all that time. Such is the power of white supremacist racism that silence is compliance to its violence." End quote. Pastor Nuchterlein points out a very important thing I think that many of us do not realize or tend to forget, that, that when we attack others, we attack ourselves. When we diminish others, we diminish ourselves. And when we make others less than human, we make ourselves less than human. As Archbishop Tutu said, we're all part of God's human family. And our individuality is tied up in our sense of community with each other. And doing this is exhausting. I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of it. I'm tired. I'm tired of hearing in the news yet another black life snuffed out by unthinking or unfeeling white persons. I'm tired of the wedge that racist acts and attitudes continue to drive between Americans of different racial groups. Aren't you tired of that too? I'm tired of seeing my white brothers and sisters' faces screwed up in anger, words of abuse and cursing pouring out of their mouths and actions that treat another as less than human. I'm tired of my brothers and sisters in Christ who are black or of another nationality being pulled over and scrutinized, being suspected and objectified, being shat upon and spit upon again and again and again all over the biological irrelevance of one's color of skin. I'm tired of it. Aren't you? How could you not be? And when you get tired of it, you have to act. You have to raise your voice to let people know that you're tired of it too. To let decision makers know that you're tired of this chaos in our culture. And let those who are abused, objectified, vilified, and victimized know that you stand with them. On Martin Luther King Jr. Day in January 2000, Beth, Jonathan, and I had grown tired of the Confederate flag flying over the state capitol in South Carolina. So we marched with members of St. Barnabas, my little black church in Jenkinsville. We marched with over 45,000 others to call in the governor to take the flag down. Just as Beth and I marched with our brothers and sisters who were tired in downtown Phoenix on Friday, June 5th, to stand with them and to show them that though we're probably some of the oldest people there, there are white senior citizens in Arizona who seek to understand their pain, who care and who want to be counted among those who want to see an end to all race-related violence. And when we get tired enough, things will change. When white people have had enough of white supremacist racists and their actions representing us, we must stand up, speak up, and call for change. Then we can truly live into the words of our baptismal promises, that we strive for justice and peace among all people, and we do respect the dignity of every human being. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Come now, Holy Spirit, come now. Because our poor, broken, sick, and hate-filled world needs God's life-transforming love. God's love expressed through our words and actions in imitation of Jesus. Now, more than ever, let us pray. 
O God, you made all humankind in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.